I want to um, make some general comments about violence and aggression uh, from a biological and uh, psychodynamic viewpoint and then discuss specifically the manifestations of uh, pathological aggression as part of the pathology of pathological narcissism. Um, because the translation is sequential, um, this practically reduces what I can say in the time I have. So you have to excuse me if at times I sound categorical without explaining the reasons for my viewpoints, but in order to present an overall summary, that's what I have to do. Violence, it seems to me, is a manifestation of an underlying general category of human behavior, which is aggression. It is a pathological manifestation of aggression with destructive consequences, destructive consequences for others as well as for the self. It derives from an excessive activation of aggression inside the individual and may be triggered by social circumstances that foster that disposition of individuals in the social realm. Aggression is, the, is a general denomination for all negative affect activations. It includes basic affective dispositions and that means primary affects, rage, anxiety, panic, disgust, fear, as well as the integration of all of these primary affects in a general negative motivational force, that is what aggression is all about. We know nowadays about the neurobiological basis of affects. We know the brain structures, the neurotransmitters that determine every one of the negative affects that I mentioned, as well of the office, the positive affects that include um, the pressure toward dependency, enjoyment, sexual excitement, surprise, uh, all of what uh, jointly uh, constitutes the affiliative tendencies that end up in love and dependency what in psychoanalytic theory is called libido. <coughs> My viewpoint is that what in psychoanalysis are called libido and the death drive or libido and aggression are hierarchically superordinate integration of basic affect dispositions that are either of a positive libidinal or negative, aggressive type. We do have evidence for each of these affects and for the many neurotransmitters involved in very specific affect systems. The affects are grouped in systems that um, if from birth on are primary motivators of behavior. These systems are, in summary, attachment, eroticism, fight-flight, 
play bonding and separation panic. These are the basic systems, each of them grouping several affects and there's overlapping within them. Both love and aggression, libido and aggression, have fundamental biological functions and permit survival. Libido, love, permits survival as social affiliations, community, and sexual reproduction of the species. Aggression permits survival by three basic functions. Protection of survival of the infant, protection of territorial claims, assurance of food, and protection of sexual competition. <coughs> These in the mammal species are the main functions of aggression. Protection of the infant, mother's aggression when the infants are threatened, and the infant's rage when his protection is threatened. Panic, separation panic when attachment is threatened. Territoriality in the sense that there is a struggle for survival when one's basic needs of food, nourishment, breathing, space is threatened. And sexual competition in the sense of being able to compete with other members of the same gender for the privilege of the sexual relation with a member of the other gender. A general issue of mammals that in human beings is expressed by the Oedipal complex. Aggression then as well as love has normal functions and um, aggression and love are mixed in complex ways. A mixture, an integration that neutralizes aggression and uses it constructively. This includes aggression as a component of sexuality, of erotism, a very important part of sexual fantasy and excitement is an aggressive element of wish to penetrate and, and be penetrated, to um, break barriers, to obtain what is forbidden. An essential aspect of sexuality is a teasing component which in its pure form can be observed in striptease. But as Storler has demonstrated, is an important aspect of the polymorphous, perverse aspects of sexual fantasy and activity. Aggression also enters self-affirmation, the establishment of one's security and daring to live up to challenges and aggression becomes integrated into one's internalized value systems, the superego is an aggressively infiltrated internal system of morality that has positive functions for the individual. Under pathological circumstances with an excessive activation of aggression, it has severely destructive consequences expressed in violence. It includes destructiveness 
directed toward others, aggression, destruction, murder, criminality, in recruitment of love and erotic excitement at the service of aggression, sadism in all its characterological forms and its sexual forms, and aggression as a manifestation of the pleasure in exercise of power and dominion, the whole psychopathology of power, power relation, and um, the consequences of establishment of master and slave relationships individually and socially. The primary affect of aggression is rage. A primary affect that can be excessively activated by many causes. First, genetic dispositions translated in pathology or disequilibrium of neurotransmitters or structures of the brain. Reduction of the serotonergic system that normally protects against aggression. Pathological activation of the testosterone system, of the um, stress alerting system, the HPA hypothesis, pituitary adrenal axis. So there are genetic reasons that translate in an excessive sensitive temperament. Genetic, constitutional, temperamental determinants of excessive aggression. Second, abnormality in the attachment system derived from insecure attachment, mother's incapacity to contain negative affects expressed by the infant with an excessive growth of the negative aspect of early experience. So that insecure attachment is a major uh, ideological feature of excessive negative affects. Third, early trauma, physical trauma, sexual trauma, witnessing of physic, chronic, physical and sexual trauma, chronic abandonment in the first few years of life, chaos and unpredictability of the family situation, all of these increase largely the negative affects the aggressive system and determine excessive activation of rage and the derivatives of rage that I will mention. The most important structural consequence of rage is the development of hatred. Hatred is the fixation of chronic rage reaction of self with a significant other. From psychoanalytic object relations theory, we know that in the early interactions of baby with mother and other family members, the expression of affective systems, the expression of temperament, the direct manifestations of affects determine responses from mother and other members and of the family, affective interaction that is internalized as affective memory. There, is, there are brain systems that specialize in the internalization of early affective memory. 
particularly the hippocampus. And early experience is sharply divided between experiences under low affect activation when usual cognitive learning occurs and high affect activation when a split in learning occurs between all good affectively determined relations, an idealized segment of the mind, and all bad aggression dominated internalizations, a persecutory segment of the mind. We say that sometimes we love the persons we love, sometimes we hate those we love, and that's perfectly normal. But an excessive of aggression that fixates hatred as a structure consists in the building up of stable systems of self and object relation under the, within the frame of rageful interaction. So there is a permanent fixation of rage expressed as hatred, which is rage with a specific orientation toward the object, either of destroying it or treating it sadistically or controlling it, so that hatred is a permanent organization of this transformed rage into its form of destroy, treat cruelly and enjoy it, or dominate it. When these dispositions are excessive, they interfere with the normal integration between the idealized and the persecutory segment of mental experience under normal conditions in the first three years of life an integration occurs gradually what in Kleinian terminology is described as the shift from the paranoid schizoid position into the depressive position in ego psychology from partial into total object relation and in terms of contemporary understanding of the pathology of personality disorders from the severe personality disorders or borderline personality organization into the neurotic personality disorders with a well-integrated ego identity in contrast to the severe personality disorders that present identity diffusion, that is a splitting of the self-concept, a splitting of the concept of significant others. All severe personality disorders have an excessive presence of unconscious conflicts around aggression is a major ecological feature and it shows in their characterological pattern as, an ex as violent behavior directed against others or the self or against both others and the self. These pathological behaviors show in a pure form in the case of the paranoid personality disorder where aggression is simply projected outside and expressed, rationalized as a protection against the fantasied aggression that comes from the outside so that uh, one deals directly with a syndrome controlled by hatred and projective identification for hatred. Strangely enough, these purely 
paranoid personalities are much less frequent than the most frequent types of these severe conditions in which violence predominates that do have paranoid features, yes, but underlying them a narcissistic personality organization. The narcissistic personality disorder emerges as the main unconscious mental structure that expresses, defends itself, and deals with excessive aggression and the potential for violence. I will give you first a list of the clinical conditions in which we see that and then say some general comments about narcissistic pathology. First of all, I need to add one more transformation of that line that goes from rage to hatred, and that is envy. Envy is a specialized form of hatred that is more specifically linked with the narcissistic personality, although you find it as a general human condition. Envy is an affect, a secondary affect derived from rage that is universally present but becomes excessive and pathological, particularly with severe personality disorders. Envy is hatred directed toward an object that has what one desires and withholds what one desires. Hatred is directed toward an enemy whom one wants to destroy, make suffer, or control. Envy is directed toward an object who has what we want and is geared to destroy not only that object, but what we want in that object. And by the same token, we are really destroying something that we need. So that envy is a particular malignant manifestation of hatred that destroy, in destroying the hated object, it destroys the internal desire and for that what one wishes. And insofar as the expression of hatred is an expression of internal relationship between a hateful self and a hated object, and a hated object and a, and a hateful self, we are destroying an internal object relation as well as the internal one is an objective of envy. It is much more dangerous and malignant and shows in, in many clinical symptoms. In, in all the cases in which hatred and envy dominate, there is an internal dependency of the individual on an object relation between uh, hating and hated self and a uh, hating and hated object, a persecutor and a victim, in which the role of victim and persecutor can easily be exchanged because one is unconsciously identified with both. People who have been severely traumatized identify unconsciously as part of the activation of excessive hatred with victim and perpetrator. This is the great 
discovery of object relations theory. It's the difference between post-traumatic stress disorder in which one is the victim of a trauma that can be, that is excessive and overwhelming and can be worked through in psychotherapy and having a personality disorder in which trauma was ideological, in which that internal double identification with victim and persecutor need to be worked out in the transference and the treatment is completely different from the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. The following are the most important syndromes in which hatred and envy and the dynamics that I mentioned predominate. In our work at our Personality Disorders Institute, we studied these syndromes over time and only gradually became aware of the importance of the underlying narcissistic structure as a common feature of them. So I will give you those syndromes and then comment on the common underlying structure. First, the antisocial personality disorder, what used to be called the psychopath. The antisocial personality disorder is the most severe personality disorder with prognosis zero for any kind of psychotherapeutic treatment. As of our knowledge to this date, we cannot treat these patients even the effort to treat them during childhood when it can be first discovered is proven to be questionable. Those cases that seemed to improve really were not some antisocial personality disorder in a strict sense. The antisocial personality disorder is characterized by complete destruction of all internalized relation with significant others, lack of any capacity of concern, love, dependency, any interest in others except an exploitive one, absence of feelings of guilt, absence of a sense of future, absence of superego functions, Two clinical forms, a passive, exploitive, parasitic one, which is survival by exploitation, less dangerous than the aggressive form that is survival by attack and destruction, destruction of property, attack against other, up to murder and criminality. These are the serial murders, uh, the most dangerous uh, patients. Uh, they have been studied by the top expert in this field in our institute, Michael Stone. Second, the syndrome of malignant narcissism, which consists in the presence of a narcissistic personality disorder, antisocial behavior, paranoid tendencies, and egocentric aggressive behavior towards self and others. These patients are different from the antisocial personality in that they still have the capacity of some investments, non-exploitive investment in others, some ideal, some responsibility, and their prognosis is much better. These patients can be treated. They represent the limit of our treatability 
although sometimes their aggressiveness, particularly aggressiveness directed against the self in the form of chronic self-mutilation or suicidal behavior, make for very difficult treatment. These patients um, uh, sometimes show as purely sadistic characterological behavior or sadomasochistic behavior, but always have the combination of the four features that I mentioned. Third, patients with is sadistic sexual perversion where the sadistic behavior is dangerous to others and where the differential diagnosis with antisocial personalities with sadistic behavior becomes important. Sadistic perversion in the same as all perversions, operates at a broad spectrum of severity. At the mildest and most frequent level, pervert at a neurotic level, at a high level, neurotic level, with good ego identity, at that level, a perversion represents a restriction of sexuality mostly determined by unconscious edible issues in which certain sexual scenarios have been activated in which sadistic or masochistic or voyeuristic or exhibitionistic or fetishistic behavior is expressed under controlled circumstance. This has very good prognosis and is part of neurotic structures. And uh, it is part of normal behavior that normal sexual fantasies and activities include these polymorphous perverse elements. These are part of normal sexuality only when they become exclusive and obligatory elements to be able to achieve excitement and orgasm are the pathology. At a severe level of borderline personality organization, sadistic sexual behavior, a sadistic perversion can become dangerous and is clearly an attack on a person the relation with whom is usually severely damaged or absent. So one has to clearly differentiate the severity where the patient is within the range of perverse behavior. The next clinical syndrome is that the syndrome of arrogance described by Dion. These are individuals who are extremely arrogant. They are uh, non-responsive to any cognitive interaction, cannot tolerate ordinary reasoning when it comes to any emotional content, even if they are highly intelligent. They show pseudo-stupidity and they have an inordinate curiosity not about themselves but about the personality of the therapist. It's a curious combination of arrogance, pseudo-stupidity and curiosity. Uh, that manifests in daily life as arrogant, destructive behavior very often coinciding also with self-directed aggression in the form of attacks of severe self-contempt, self-depreciation, inferiority, suicidal attempts. The dynamic of the system 
is an expression of sadistic violence while denying the awareness of that affect. The pseudo-stupidity protects them from any self-reflection while in their arrogant behavior they act out the aggression and in the curiosity they try to control the therapist so that they don't get the counter-attack that they fear out of projective identification. The next syndrome is a non-depressive, severe, chronic self-mutilation. It is chronic sadism directed against the self. These are extremely severe cases that probably only those who work in hospitals see frequently. For example, one of my patients would um, cut off her fingers, stabbed into her eye, lost an eye. So these are not the simple self-cutters like the ordinary borderline patients who cut themselves as part of affect storms or rage attacks. These are chronic self mutilating episodes very often dissociated from the rest of the personality, extremely dangerous and at the limit of what is treatable. In the treatment one has to transfer those self-directed sadistic behaviors into the transference which creates great difficulties in severe sadomasochistic transferences. The patient tries to defend himself against that by maintaining a general friendliness and openness disrupted by severe self-mutilation. One of our patients took rat poison. The nurses looked day and night and couldn't find the rat poison while the patient's prothrombin time went up and she developed internal hemorrhages and had to be transferred to internal medicine and probably is dead by now. These are perhaps the most severe cases. The, the, the final form of this extreme self-destructiveness is different from all the others in that as a defense against primitive aggression, an early elimination of all object relations has taken place. It is what Andre Green has described as the syndrome of the dead mother. Uh, very often in patients, it is a rare clinical syndrome, but clearly delimited, usually with a background of chronic severe depression in mother, and an unconscious identification with the dead mother that coincides with a dismantling of representations of others and even of representation of self, except at a level of cognitive adjustment to the world. They see they are friendly people who work, learn, function socially, but have zero motivation for anything. No pleasure, no interest, no commitment, no dedication. They have a good superego function, they are moral, they are decent, there is nothing wrong with their behavior except a sense that it doesn't make sense to live and in the long run 
they are at high suicidal risk. The treatment of these patients means an extremely long, years long treatment in which one tries to reactivate those very profound early aggressive components of experience and the ambivalences behind it that may be achieved in some cases, not in others. All these, all these syndromes have underlying them a narcissistic personality structure. The narcissistic personality structure is constituted by a pathological, grandiose self, an abnormal structure that is superimposed on the underlying fragmentation of the self-concept, the splitting that dominates of the self-concept and of the concept of significant others that I mentioned. The pathological grandiose self is an integrated grandiose self that protects them against this chaotic world and shows clinically in grandiose self-centered behavior lack of capacity of investment in depth in others an inordinate need for admiration as a way to maintain the grandiosity of the self and a serious defect in their superego system because the ego ideal that is part of him, the internalized ideals that guide one have been absorbed into the pathological grandiose self. So they are as good and as great as they should be. There is no internal demand. They are it. And therefore the superego is only left with its negative persecutory aspects that are projected as paranoid tendencies. So that grandiosity, that frail grandiosity may be punctured by lack of admiration, failure to obtain admiration, and then they have sudden collapse of the self-esteem. So self-esteem oscillates severely. Their lack of capacity for investment in others shows in instability and exploitiveness of others. Their lack of investment in work, in the incapacity for stable work patterns, search for immediate success rather than real investment. The best cases where the pathological grandiose self functions well only shows as mildly superior, arrogant, exploitive, non-empathic behavior. The more severe cases show as gross superiority and gross incapacity to work, failure in work and profession, gross incapacity to enter into relationship, a typical narcissistic promiscuity. They fall in love, get involved, their unconscious envy devalues the person they idealized love disappears on to the next, so they go through cycles of infatuation and devaluation and can never commit themselves. We find this in both genders. And the more severe cases still show the uncontrolled breakthrough of the underlying conflicts around aggression that and any primitive envy against which the pathological self can no longer protect themselves and these are the cases that show in the syndromes that are mentioned. It is 
um, 11.30 and in theory I should stop, but I really didn't start at 10 and uh, I asked for the possibility of extending my presentation by Kim by 15 minutes and I do hope that you will not get angry with me for making that demand on you. Uh, so I would like to use these 15 minutes to give some general principles of treatment. First of all, in all these cases, there are different there are differences in the treatment that I cannot explain for lack of time. I will only talk about commonalities. The most important issue is the unconscious identification with a sadistic, controlling, hostile object that sometimes is murderous and a victim of that object. The patient is both unconsciously and in the transference will project onto the therapist both the victimizer and the victim. And the therapist has to be prepared to interpret these two relations instead of being fixated by the idea this patient has been a victim of trauma. It's a poor victim and missing the unconscious identification with the perpetrator. That's the most important principle. Second, the patient in projecting onto the therapist his persecutor by means of projective identification will do all he can to provoke the therapist to hate the patient. And it is impossible not to hate the patient because the patient will know how to provoke, how to get you to hate him. So it is important to accept hatred in the counter-transference without acting on it, to tolerate it fully not to deny it in oneself and then interpret gradually to the patient how he is attributing to the therapist the same thing at other times he clearly is himself as we have, are demonstrating to him at different points. Third, it is essential to maintain a strict frame of the treatment, what is permitted, what is not permitted, and to have a consistent frame with all patients, so you can tell when your frame is being destroyed. The therapist has to maintain that frame consistently and put limits on the patient. In the session, if the patient attacks the patient, stop the patient. Of the treatment, if the patient does not follow certain basic contractual agreements, end the treatment. And we always give the patient a second chance. But during the second chance, we keep interpreting that the treatment is hanging by a thread and can be stopped at any point by the patients repeating the behavior that breaks the frame. Patients will try to, to blame the therapist for ending the treatment when in fact it's the patient who ends the treatment and that has to be preventively interpreted session by session when you give the patient a second chance. Fourth, the therapist has to maintain a position of technical neutrality, which does not mean indifference. It means that he does not intervene 
under the effect of his countertransference reaction. Before the therapist intervenes, he has to have understood the countertransference reaction, understand it in terms of what's going on in the transference, be able to interpret, be able to make decisions. If you make decisions that break technical neutrality to control the, the frame of the treatment. Therefore, in general, don't make decisions in the middle of a session in which you decide to make such decisions. Wait until the next session to think it over, except if you have to end the session, then you end the session. But that is not dangerous. Fifth, the security of the therapist is the most important consideration in the treatment of these patients. You have to feel secure physically, legally, emotionally, socially, so that patients who threaten you in any way have to be controlled so that you do not feel threatened. Your feeling secure is a precondition for treating patients. You do whatever you need to feel secure. That may mean bringing in the family of a chronically self-mutilating, severely destructive patient whose self-destructive and suicidal behavior is an unconscious triumph over the treatment and not an expression of guilt as in depression. So the family should know there is a risk of death and have to accept that so that you are not persecuted by the fear that your patient may die. If necessary, you have to assure legal protection if that's what you need, putting in writing everything what you're doing. So if you feel paranoid and afraid of persecution by the patient and the family, you do all you need to do to control that until you feel secure. Six, you have to be able to identify with the sadistic pleasure of the patient. It is essential that the patient tolerate his conscious experience the primitive aggression that he has been acting out. It is the first step for the capacity to gradually integrate love and hatred to bring about an overcoming of the splitting. And that cannot be if he doesn't fully accept his own sadistic pleasure. That means that you have to be able to experience the pleasure with destructiveness, with sexual sadism, with uh, physical violence, rather than getting simply horrified by it. As long as you are horrified in the countertransference, the patient will not tolerate to accept that as part of his emotional reality. All of us have a potential at certain moments to become murderers. If we believe in the theory of the Oedipal complex, but between a theory and an emotional recognition, there's a big difference. So to treat these patients, you have to be able to be open to very painful and disagreeable experiences. And, uh, and that means uh, a broad tolerance of countertransference without having to act on it. But it may be that every therapist treating these patients needs at one point consultation, discussion with colleagues. We have a group situation we meet every week to discuss these most difficult patients that helps us to. My last point is that 
you have to accept that some of these patients cannot be helped and um, will die or will go to prison and uh, you uh, have to keep within the legal boundaries of the country in which you are if your patients commit crimes you have to consult your lawyer what your legal responsibilities are that is part of what you do to be safe don't try to be heroes don't play heroes you are an ordinary therapist dealing with impossible patients and you have to accept that some of these treatments will have to end in failure that there are cases that can't be helped I, those of you who read French I recommend the last book written by Andre Green my good friend who unfortunately died and illusion et désillusion dans le travail psychanalytique and you will see some feeling for those kind of patients and I give a general recommendation to our students to be impatient in every session not in the sense of being nervous but in the sense of trying to use it as well as you can and be very patient in the long run in patience in the here and now patience in the long run I think that is a helpful attitude because many of these patients with narcissistic structure try to empty out the treatment by repeating the same things again and again and again and you have to treat every session as if it were the first one and if the patient talks about triviality to be ready to say what are we talking about how relevant is that when in your life this and that is happening you always have to keep aware what are the main problems in the patient's life and when there is a trivialization of the content of the hours you use what's going on in the patient's life to bring him back to emotional uh, reality thank you very much for your attention